Hey everybody, welcome to the Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Peter Cunhart's here. Trey Ellis is here. We got some great things to talk about. King in the Wilderness, brand new documentary. Peter's a director. Trey's a producer. Guys, thanks so much for being here. Great Thank you. It's great. Thanks. So I, I watched the documentary and it was fascinating on a number of different levels. But Peter, let's start out with you. You've done Warren Buffett. You've done JFK. You've done a lot of really interesting people. How did this process all come together? And what was it like telling the story of MLK in those three final crazy years of his life? Well, those other shows that you've mentioned, throughout, throughout the past 30 years as I've produced other films, I've always wanted to do King because I, cause King, King is the great American Shakespearean story of a moral leader like no other. And, and I was aware of how good his stories, story is by reading about him and by seeing film clips, but there was never an opportunity to... Uh, to do it until the 50th anniversary became kind of a, pe a news peg that everyone paid attention to. Uh, we decided to do the last three years because Trey and Taylor Branch, who was our historical consultant and executive producer, basically said, along with everyone else, we don't want to do this unless we do something new. Right. We, don't want to, we don't want to tread over the same territory of, of I have a dream and desegregation and everything we've all been, it's all been drummed into all our heads and kind of make, made us glaze over over the past years. So we, we all felt that King was a cardboard character, but if we looked at these last three years when he was kind of alone and against all powers, uh, it would be a fresh new story. And Trey, we were talking beforehand, King just didn't know when to stop. He just kept going and felt like he needed to continue to go. But the Vietnam War, really struggled with that and there were a number of different factors to it so what was the most surprising thing or the most fascinating part of, about all that for you uh, yeah to me his balance between his his moral compass and, and, and the short-term and long-term gain so he knew he from the beginning the war is bad right he knew he had to, he wanted to come out against the war but he had to measure that against the support he would lose and then when he finally does in the Riverside Church he does it in the most erudite and intellectual way possible thinking that maybe that would insulate him from some of the venom, but he, was, he, he underestimated that. His friends abandoned him, the NAACP, you know, everybody, front, front page uh, banners calling him a traitor. You know, he just, he'd never been more lonely. Uh, but he kept going on after that. That was, you know, for two years after that, he still kept going on. And that's what's amazing. It's crazy. I mean, the Times called him out as soon as that happened. And right. you just you couldn't imagine for somebody that did so many great things. And his relationship with Lyndon Johnson was interesting in there, too, because he had these obligations to his people and his friends. And then at the same time, he had developed a relationship with the president that really no other leader had ever really developed before. It was pretty fascinating. Yeah, they, were, they would get each other on the phone routinely. And it just, but they knew they had to do this dance. They didn't. They liked each other more than they needed each other right. in ways that he, so, so when King knows he's going to make this break from him, but he just says, his heart tells him he can't hold, he'll, you know, be quiet any longer. And now we kind of say, oh, it's pretty easy to say the Vietnam War bad, right? Right, at the time, totally like, different story. It was, no one had come back, I, the people were coming out of World War II, the idea of, of uh, challenging a, a president in wartime had never been done before. So the other really cool part of the documentary is that it was people who worked with him, friends, and just the most intimate look at him. So whether it was Harry Belafonte or, or Joan Baez or, or Jesse Jackson, who was there just moments after he shot. I mean, we got such a personal look. So for you guys, when you're doing these interviews, when you're putting it all together, you know, how crazy was it to get the most personal view of somebody whose story has been told so many different times? I'll let Trey tell you about the people themselves, but what, I w what I'll say in, in preface to it was, we caught these people at the perfect time. They're all in, at the t getting older. They're right. all in their 80s, most of them. And they've done interviews in the past, but they were ready to open up and they were ready to talk very personally from the heart. And I think they held nothing back. And I think that's why this film it g allows you to meet Martin Luther King on a, an extremely personal level and kind of get the sense that you know him. Definitely. But, but Trey interviewed them and, and, and had a real experience doing so. Yeah, I didn't have this, you know, I thought of King as just the guy from the books, so the, you know, you know, the George Washington, Martin Luther yep. King. I'm talking to all these people, and um, I remember talking to Jesse Jackson, and he's telling, starting to telling a story, and he's kind of rambling, where's this going? And then he goes, bop! And I realized he's telling the story right at the moment when Dr. King was shot, mm. severing his tie. I mean, I really almost fell out of my chair. Mm. I'm talking to Diane Nash, and then, and then as we're leaving, I said, oh, my parents had gone to Howard University. He said, what are their names? And she knew my parents. Wow. And so this has been a real personal journey for me in a way that I feel like my 
uncles and aunts knew him well, like in one person away from him in a way that's really changed my life. Yeah, no question about it. So we mentioned Riverside Church before. You guys did the premiere of the film at Riverside Church. John Lewis said that that was MLK's best speech in his opinion. So for both of you guys, why was that such a critical speech for him and how amazing was it to show the film at that church? Right, for a couple of things. The reason, like, it's, he knew that it was so sensitive, this speech. He couldn't, he was really great at just winging it. We have great stories where they'll say, uh, Dorothy Cotton says, he can wake him up like 20 minutes before, and he'll just like kind of wake up and, and give a stem wind of a speech. <laughs> this one was different. This one was written and rewritten. Harry Belafonte's got great, th talks about uh, old drafts. The notes, like, right? He swan yeah. dives into the, into, into the wastebasket to get his notes. Um, so, this one he knew he had to be very careful about everything he said, but then on top of that, then he's, but he adds his flourish is probably one of the greatest speakers in the history of mankind, right? So those put together in the venue of this, one of the most iconic churches in, in, in America, uh, really changed everything. And then the fact that he died a year later right. to the day is just, you, it's, it's incredible. And Peter, it's such a beautiful church too, to show the film there must have been awesome for you. It, it was, we, we knew it would be a spiritual experience if we had it there, and I, I, I gotta give HBO a lot of credit. It, it required building an enormous stage at, in the nave. It meant setting up a 40-foot screen, and it meant a sound system that, that could allow you to hear a movie in an echoey chamber. It wasn't designed for that. I, I, uh, I. It, it was. It was two days after uh, Dr. King's granddaughter had had spoken out in the march in Washington, in Washington, and and I told the story there that I was struck by her smile. That when she smiled after say enough, after saying enough is enough, she gave this broad grin, which was the exact same smile of Martin Luther King. And I just kind of superimposed the two over my head and felt uh, in, in front of my face and, and realized that he was kind of speaking to us in some kind of spiritual way. Yeah, no question about it. And I think one of the other interesting parts of the documentary, we, we find out that King was offered the pastor position at Riverside. So I think the big question is, what if he had taken that position? Where would he be now? How different would things be? What do you guys think about that? Yeah, those what ifs are so hard, but you just, I mean, it, we you know, the world, I think, would be a better place, for sure. Um, but I do think that his, uh, if you think about it, his legacy has lived on to that march, to the, to the, the Children's March, uh, you know, the Parkland March, to the, uh, the Women's March, yep. um, the, the rights for, you know, the, 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 what he did, starting in Montgomery and the bus boycott, those ripples we're still living with to this day. So in many ways, even though he's not physically here, that movement has led to liberation movements all over the planet and still she gave us this blueprint of nonviolent change as really the only effective way for long-term change. You know, if he did take that post at Riverside, he'd be 89 today. Mm -hmm. He'd be 89 today. I think he would still be active and I think he would be a moral leader in a time of our lives where there are no moral leaders. There, there's, there's, we're, 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 we're very few moral leaders, it, it's, uh, none in Washington. So I think, I think the fact that uh, he would have brought that kind of greatness right through to today would have made an enormous difference in addition to the legacy he's left not being here. Yeah, no question about it. Now, the other part of the documentary that was really quite interesting was the whole Chicago angle. And King had experienced such racism in the South, but the Chicago experience shook him because that's Northern racism. He had never seen that. So, Trey, from a historical perspective, just kind of describe how that all went down. And then, Peter, for you, just the, the film aspect of it and telling that story. So, Trey, let's start with you. Well, a couple of things. As someone who grew up in the 70s in the North, I experienced that racism myself all the time. I mean, when I talked to my kids about being called the N-word, you know, till I was 16, 17 years old, where it felt like that was a, a sort of normal for me. Uh, I wasn't as surprised as some other people have been about those Chicago right. movements. But what happens, what you see is that that when Northerners were confronted, it was easier for Northerners to say, oh, those Southerners and segregation, 
visible, physical, legal segregation, that's really bad. But our de facto segregation, that's just how we are. We have our different neighborhoods, we have our jobs, but if you come in our backyard, that NIMBY, not in my backyard movement, is stronger than anything. So you see the, the level of, of just venom aimed at, and really violence aimed at him from the North. And I think what's really interesting too is that these white Northerners in Chicago, they're flying rebel flags, they're talking about where are white civil rights, a lot of sort of the the, sort of this, the, the Trump movement that we thought that was we so, today. Yeah. Right, we thought it was so underground. It was underground, and then you scratch it, and then it erupts like a volcano. Yeah, it was really just lying right there at the surface. Well, uh, we, we, had, we were fortunate to have a wonderful film researcher, Jill Cowan. And when she began unearthing these swastikas and these little, you know, the little boy playing the clarinet and shouting out at the marchers, uh, the similarities were mind blowing to what we're seeing today. It's interesting. The way she found a lot of the material was that it was in the archives of the networks. Mm. So that when, 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 when a news story was shot for uh, the march in Chicago, or the, the demonstration in Chicago, they, they would have pulled a few selects off 16 millimeter film and then distort away the rest. So she found those original wow. reels and retransferred them. So they were, they were coming out for the first time. And finally, for you guys, when people watch this documentary, what do you want them to walk away thinking about the totality of Martin Luther King Jr., but more specifically, those final three years where things got really crazy, he felt like he couldn't get away, and ultimately, he just wanted to create as much change as possible in the short amount of time that he was there on Earth? Yeah, I, I, to me, the importance of this film is activism. I want the people to, so we think if had he lived, he could have saved us. Diane Nash is really clear about that. No, no one's going to save you. He did the work when no one else was, when the, when the cameras were off, he was still doing the work. So what I want people to leave with is like, we have to all do the work. So really we, ha we have no excuses. He did it with, with no, no social media, uh, the funds had dried up, he just put his head down and kept keeping on. And I think we, right now, uh, we, need to, we need to keep keeping on. Yeah, put your head down, move forward, keep doing it no matter what the obstacles, but push forward. That's my message. Martin Luther King Jr., a man unlike any other, this film certainly fits that bill too. Peter Conhart, Trey Ellis, guys, thanks a lot. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.